I believe, at least in part, I couldn't say completely, but I believe in part the fruit or the sowing of the Word of God, the sowing and the fruit from last week is evident here today. And here's why I say that, because when we're talking about the most important series, and we're talking about what brings us joy, it's Jesus first, that's the J, what's the Y? Yourself last, I'll catch you next Sunday on that one. And others in between. When we start talking about Jesus first, I'm telling you, I saw people praying here last Sunday. Big things happening because they have reset themselves. I believe we have reset ourselves that Jesus is the first in our life. And I hope this week the decisions you've made and the values you've embraced has reflected what Jesus said is that we're going to love him with all of our heart, mind, and soul, and strength. Amen? So, if the ushers will help me right now. If you filled out one of these cards here, I want you to just raise your hand and they'll collect them. But I'm doing this for a reason. It's more than just giving of our finances, our treasure. We've got to continually give. Just lift your card right up and the ushers will pick them up. That's right, just leave them up there. But hear me today. It's also about putting him first, not just treasure, but with time and talents. Jesus has got to be first in everything we do and say. And so with that in mind, I'm going to take you back to Matthew chapter 22, verse 37 and 38. Jesus said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all your soul, and with your mind. This is the first and great commandment. I need to go on and read 39. And the second is like it. This is my mistake. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and prophets. Praise God. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. And then it says in verse 39, and the second is like it, you shall love who? Your neighbor as yourself. All these two commandments, on these two commandments hang all the law and prophets. Praise God. I want to talk to you about others. Others. You may be seated in the name of the Lord. These two commands are not optional. Loving God and loving your neighbor. You don't get to pick that, and I don't either. These are God's clear and direct commands to all people everywhere for all time. And if you'll notice, nothing in Scripture diminishes either one of these commands in, in the least. In fact, they only, the other places of Scripture only magnify or give further explanation of what it means to love God and love your neighbor. Of the 613 laws that were out there in the Mosaic Law that the Pharisees and the leadership Presented. Jesus said, and the scriptures support it, loving God and loving your neighbor is what it's all about. As I mentioned, this all came from a question asked, teacher, what is the greatest commandment? And we talked about it, that God in flesh, Jesus Christ, answered and quoted from the Shema and said, the Lord is one and you're to worship him with your heart, your soul, your mind. But today, I'm gonna to talk about that second commandment, which means to love your neighbor in this way. Arguably, we might have a hard time, uh, maybe an easier time loving God than we have loving neighbors. Because God, you know, he's the boss. Furthermore, we can't see him. According to Jesus, the second most commandment, the most important commandment, says that loving our neighbor is an essential component, watch this, of loving God. 
Say, well, pastor, I'm with you on last week. I want to love God, but I, 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 I'm not sure. No, I said, they're both essential. They're both connected. You can't have one without the other. In fact, Jesus said in verse 39, the second is like it. Other translation says it's equally important. The second is like it in importance. And as much as it's true and we aptly honor the greatest commandment, we cannot ignore the second commandment. Of course, we love God with all of our being, with our values, our decisions. Of course, that's the most important thing. But think of it this way. I would say it this way. Jesus is relaying foundational principles that build one off another. If you love God the way you're supposed to, you will love your neighbor. So let's support this. 1 John 4, 19. We love because he first loved us. There it is. All love ultimately comes from God. Genuine love is never self-generated by his creatures. We love because he loves us. He is the source of love. He is the example of love. God doesn't have love. He is love. And so John is saying that the source and ultimate comes from him. All in favor, say aye. If you're in, not in favor, that's the word of God. But let's go on. Whoever claims to love God. You love God? Careful. Yet hates a brother or a sister. Is a liar. I'm so glad I'm reading the Bible. You can't fuss with me. I'm reading the Bible. For whoever does not love their brother and sister whom they have seen cannot love God whom they have not seen. Whoa. You think I'm in your business? Why don't you let John be your pastor for a moment? And he has given us this command. Everybody say command. I'm coming back to that. Anyone who loves God must also love their brother and sister. What does he mean, this command? He's talking about anyone who loves God has got to love their brother and their sister. Let's go to John 13, verse 34 real quickly. Jesus says it this way. He says, a new command. Now, now what's all that about? I give you love one another. Really, in a sense, it was an old one. Because the same way, love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, Shema, Deuteronomy 6, 4, this second commandment is coming from Leviticus 19, 18. So really, they, it wasn't a new one, except the fact that it was new because it was the mark of a special bond now created by Christ's great love for them. God had come in flesh, and there's something new, there's some new understanding or relationship in fact, Jesus says, here is the standard for Christ's love. Watch it. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you're my disciples. Is that if you sing the throne room on a Sunday morning and feel Jesus, you're in. No. He said that you have love one another. For another. You see this interchange. It's all I'm trying to establish. You see this in intertwining of these two loves. We love God and we love our neighbor. Now let's go back to the Apostle John. That was working pretty good. First John chapter 3, verse 16. This is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us. That's how you know what love is. And we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. The cross demonstrated God's amazing love for us. I'm so thankful that he bled and he died for my sins and your sins. 
But John is saying that's the standard. We should reflect this love in our selfless and our compassionate acts of service. In other words, I can't say I love God and it doesn't show up in compassionate attitude and actions one with another. Now John gives us an example in the next verse. He says, if anyone has material possessions and sees a brother or sister in need, but has no pity on them, how can the love of God be in that person? Sister Kim, you better come back and sing the throne room. Oh Lord, help us. Failing to extend God's love to those in need, John's saying, is equivalent to loving in word or tongue only. So what I'm trying to tell you is love your neighbor is a foundational principle. It was in Leviticus 19.18. Jesus quoted it here in this text. But it was also twice by Paul, once by James. Let's look at Romans 13 verse 8. Paul said, Oh, no one anything except to love one another. For he who loves another has fulfilled the law. And then he starts listening in verse 9. For the commandments are, you shall not commit adultery. Check. You shall not murder. Check. You shall not steal. Check. You shall not bear false witness. Not covet. And if there is any other commandment, he said all of them are what? They are summed up in this saying, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. If you didn't commit adultery this week, praise God. But Jesus said, Paul's teaching from his word, that, that all of the commandments are summed up. That if you love your neighbor as yourself, then you're going to be okay. Because if I love my neighbor or my wife, I'm not going to commit adultery against her. You see, it's a relationship. I also love my life. That's why I'm not going to do that either. Amen. Look at verse 10. Love does no harm to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. On and on it goes. Galatians 5, 14. The entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command. Love your neighbor as yourself. He's saying this is how important it is. If I say love the Lord your God and I say love your neighbor, they are working together. James called it the royal law. James 2, 8. Why do you call it the royal law? It's the law of love. It's royal because it's a supreme law. It's the source of all other laws governing human relationships. If you really keep the royal law in the scripture, love your neighbors yourself, you are doing right. But if you show favoritism or partiality, you sin and are convicted by the law as the law breakers. Let me tell you right now, the church was preaching against partiality and favoritism before it was a news cycle and we're gonna preach it when the news cycle is over. Prejudice is against God's word and it is sin. And prejudice comes in all shapes and sizes. It comes in color and economics and all of the things that we try to lift ourselves up above somebody else. But I say God baptize us with the principle of loving our neighbor as ourself. And when I do, you don't always think like me. You may not have the same politics as me, but here's one thing I know is that I love God and I love you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He's saying it's the summation of all those laws. We doing all right out there? So the value of four inspired writers of what we call the Gospels, I really love it. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. Sometimes Matthew, Mark, and Luke are called synoptic, which means like. But uh, all four of them, they have distinctive perspectives to their unique audiences. And so often they'll look at the same story. And so in this story that we've been looking at in the most important series, um, we have looked at both Matthew and Mark. Uh, today, I wanna draw your attention to Luke because he shares the same answer Jesus gave to a different question. Now, perhaps this lawyer, this scribe, maybe he just asked one more question. We know what is the greatest commandment was asked. 
He asked another one here, and, and maybe it was just uh, more than one question, and Jesus' consistent response was there. If it is another setting, Jesus is still preaching the same message, love God and love your neighbor. We do know, and this is what I want to show you, that Luke gives us a valuable teaching of this commandment to love your neighbor. And here's what it is. He answers the question, who is your neighbor? Look at your friend there next to you and say, who is your neighbor? Say, dummy me, I'm sitting next to you. No, I'm going to help you with that. Let's go to Luke chapter 10. I'm going to show you this different question, same answer. Verse 25, there was an expert in the law. He was a scholar. He was well-versed in scriptures. We know there was a lawyer in uh, Matthew and Mark's passages. And he's either to take issue with Jesus, find out what kind of teacher he is. Somewhere, he's, he's just a lawyer. Just, that's it, Okay. And he says, what is written, excuse me, he said, here's the question, what must I do to inherit eternal life? All right, that's a very common question. You find it other places. What must I do to be saved? What, what am I must do to have eternal life? And you know what Jesus said? He said, what's written in the law? How do you read it? He said, well, remember, he's a lawyer. So he said, well, I know what it says. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, your strength, your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. And you know what Jesus said? He said, you've answered correctly. You get an A plus, you get a hundred. He said, do this and you will live. He means you will have eternal life. That's awesome. Done. Unfortunately, it didn't end there. This expert in religious law shows a wrong attitude. Look at verse 29. He wanting to justify himself. He wasn't done with that. He said, I want to know who is my neighbor. What minimum do I have to do in order to get by? Who is my neighbor? What, what is the definition so I can check that box off? Do I have to take a turkey dinner down at Thanksgiving to the homeless and then I'll be done for a year or maybe life? I need to know what I got to do to check this off. Hello. Jesus' dialogue with the expert of the law led to a story that we usually call the Good Samaritan. Look in verse uh, 30. In reply, Jesus said, and he tells a story. Everybody wake up, it's story. A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho. Those people understood, and some scholars said that it was a road that maybe dropped 3,300 feet, maybe over the course of 17 miles, but it was just called the Bloody Way because it went through rocky uh, terrain and desert country, and it provided place, safe places for robbers to hide behind and waylay defenseless travelers. And sure enough, as the story goes, that was the fate of this man. He was attacked by robbers, and they stripped him of his clothes and they beat him and went away leaving him half dead as the story continues a priest happened to go down the same road and when he saw that man a priest passed by on the other side and then a Levite a temple assistant he, he comes to the same place sees the same guy and passes on the other side but when, verse 33, a Samaritan, as he traveled, he came where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him. He had compassion on him. I want you to see in this story a demonstration of what it means to love your neighbor. Remember, that's the question. The question was, how do I get to heaven? He said, love God and love your neighbor. And he says, who is my neighbor? And look what Jesus does through this story. He says, this man, he went to him and bandaged him his wounds, pouring oil and wine. There was healing that was going on to this man. He put him on his own donkey, brought him to an inn and took care of him. And the Bible says the next day he took out two denarii. This was enough to keep him in those days for two months in the end. He said, here it is. He said, and when I return, I'm going to reimburse you for any other extra expense. All this illustrates 
what it means to be a neighbor. If you're going to be a neighbor, you got to go to where the man is. You can't be inconvenient. You can't pass by. You've got to go to where he is. You've got to have compassion upon them. I've got to understand that there's healing that takes place when we're a true neighbor. And we, we understand that there's some expenses that go into this. All of this is there. And so he says in verse 29, him wanting to justify himself said, who is my neighbor? Now in verse 36, this is Jesus asked a question. Verse 36, which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell in the hands of robbers? The question was, noun, which one? Jesus' question was, verb, which one was the act of neighboring? Because a neighbor is not an address necessarily. It is an attitude. It is something that says, he says, uh, the expert of the law says, verse 37, the one who has mercy on him. He said, you and go and do likewise. He was challenging the narrow thinking of this lawyer. And he tried to broaden it up. You know what a neighbor is? A neighbor doesn't just mean somebody that lives nearby. A neighbor is anyone who has a need in which we come in contact with. We don't put geographical limitations upon a love for a neighbor, but instead we want to do an abundance of good for our fellow man as God has been so kind to us. He said, if we're a neighbor, we're gonna help those that are in need. And are you hearing me today? That just doesn't mean the one that you go to church with or you're in a community group with or who you like. Because notice, the characters in this story is a priest, a Levite, and a Samaritan. And that is very significant. He did not commend a religious leader. He did not commend a lay associate. He said to this hated foreigner called a Samaritan, this is the one that really showed us what it means to be a neighbor. Because, oh yeah, those Jews, excuse me, those Samaritans, they were half Jews and they were half Gentiles and they were not, there was open hostility between the two of them. But you know what Jesus is saying? That love knows no national boundaries. He's telling them, if we're going to love, it doesn't matter where you come from. We love as Christ has loved us. So I've been talking to you, I've referenced it. This is what it means in the Bible to be a good steward, that God owns everything. We're just the managers. Yeah, we talked last week about treasure, but you know what we're talking about right now? We're talking about being a steward of our time and our talent because everybody has their weaknesses and you know, you gotta get this right now, God is always gonna meet you at your point of weakness and he's gonna keep giving you the test until you pass it. So some of you had a trust test last week, filling that card out. I don't know. Felt a little pushback, a little attitude. There you go, talking about money. I'm over that. It's not about money. It's about the kingdom of God. And some of you say, you know what, but I don't have that problem. But oh, today, you say, ooh, I can give online, but time? talent, the gifts God gives me, I make money off that, but I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna express that through the kingdom of God. Hello? 1 Peter 4.10, 1 Peter 4.10 says each of you, okay, look around. Now it's your, this is your legal chance to be nosy. You can look to the side, front, back, whatever. Each of you, all of us, should use whatever gift you have received. How many know that God has given you gifts? Everybody's hand should be up. Because if you don't know, we're going to help you. What have we received those gifts for? Somebody tell me. It's on the board, class. To what? To speak in tongues? 
No, to serve others. And when you do that, you are a faithful steward of God's grace in various forms. What I'm preaching right now, plug it in. It's disciple making. It's investing yourself in a relationship. It's teaching a Bible study. It's investing as they go along, maturing in Christ. That's what it means to be a neighbor. To be a neighbor means that we also bless our community. Two of our community groups, and there may be more of them, I don't know. But I know two of them that's comprised of our young adults, the hyphen collected food for the needy. That's, that's being a neighbor. I'm calling her out because it was really a passing comment. It had nothing to do with trying to tell me this young, this, oh, you're going to love that, Sister Danny. I almost called you a young lady. Praise God. You are a young lady. Amen. You are. But no, really, there was just a text conversation. It had nothing to do. It's like, hey, I'm not going to be here for such and such because I'm doing da, da, da. That's all it was. It was a passing comment. But I think you were taking food to a shelter. I think you do that every week. What is it? Once a month. Oh, well, you're doing more than me. There's no church program. So, you know, I am waiting. I look every week on that weekly update to see when we're gonna start giving to our community food and clothing. I just don't see it. I wonder who could lead that program so that we could finally give to the needy. You know, the way is needing help from their after school program, and I haven't talked to Brother Anthony since then, but we got a little break that we might be able to have an inroad into a school. That's wonderful, but you know what? Like uh, Brother Flosser said the other night, people say, I'm with you in spirit. I won't be there, but I'm with you in spirit. He said, I don't like to preach to spirits. I like to preach to bodies. <laughs> Amen? It's, it's, it's community involvement. It means disciple making. Being a neighbor means serving in our communities. You know what? Being a neighbor means volunteering in this local assembly. I'm going to give you a statement. Churches are filled with members who have lost the joy of salvation because they never discovered the joy of serving. Leave it up there for a while. Meditate on it. Take a picture. Pray over it. I don't think we have ill will, but it's so easy just to get inbred and, and, and we get a little like, you know, I'm coming to church, but I just feel empty. I just feel fussy. I just feel, well, could it be that we've lost the joy of our salvation because we haven't discovered the joy of serving? Because whatever we do to serve is for two purposes. It is to glorify God and to serve others. It's to glorify God and serve others. This is the most important thing, to love God and to love your neighbor. Everything we do is for the glory of God and to serve others. They're the greatest commandments. So every time you study a lesson for community group, whether you're a leader, or I hope others in the group are getting a chance to do that too, you're doing it for God and you're doing it for others. Every time they have a music rehearsal, this band's here every morning, well, Sunday mornings, uh, nine o'clock, you know what that is for? To glorify God and to serve others. It's to help us with an atmosphere of worship. When the rehearsal comes at 9.30, all of those things, every time we do something, it is for God and it is for others. And I could not even begin to, to, to name names of, of the people that invest in the kingdom of God and in this church. And, and I, just, I just left uh, uh, that, that place in there, that, that live stream. Praise God. Jameer, you're running it right now. 
How you doing? But the guys, some of the guys were in there. I said, thank you for what you're doing. Even today, there's people that were sick and couldn't make it here. And I said, thank God for live stream. You're watching right now because of that. What I'm trying to tell you is everything is a ministry. We're believing God for Sister Palmer. She's probably watching right now. She's going to get strong enough to come back. Fern and Mike Knight, you're going to get strong enough to come back. But you know what? It seems so technical. Get a camera, do all that stuff. But do you understand? Everything we do is for the glory of God and to serve others. And anytime you're feeling fat and sassy, why don't you start giving a little bit and you'll start becoming fulfilled in your life. I'm fat, sassy, and fulfilled. Praise God. It's little things. Fixing a door. Shampoo and carpet. Putting flowers out there. It's all for the glory of God. After we're done praying, however we're going to do this, one of the huge responses you're going to have to this message is going back to that little yellow sign there that says, serve, see Sister Penny, our ministry guide, guidance team lead, and say, hey, what are ways I can get involved? There's people here that would love to take seven of their ten jobs and pass them out to these other folks. I don't think people like, well, I, 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 don't, I really don't think or believe people have resistance. It's just, my dad always used to say, boy, if you don't let them know the need, they won't give. Now that may be talking, he was talking about offering, but I'm talking about anything. Man, we, we could use some clerical help, volunteer clerical help, help for our paid staff at the, at the office. Sister Penny will tell you things. Even if you can't physically be here and serve on Sunday, there's so much that goes on between Monday and Saturday. And there's ways that you can be involved uh, virtually. There's ways that you can do things. You know why? Because we're trying to invest in something that's bigger than ourselves. And so I'm asking you a question. I, I, I don't judge it by weekly. I don't judge it by Sunday. I don't even judge it. I'm just saying in the course of a year, what is it that you contribute to this local assembly that makes a difference? And if you weren't doing it, there'd be a hole. If you're not able to answer that clearly, you know what you do? You don't get offended. You just go back to the table. <laughs> it's just that easy. Oh, no, just calm down. You love God? You love your neighbor? Because that's how we make a difference. Little by little, every act matters. I've shared this many years ago, but it's a beautiful story, not original with me. But a lot of times, when we have consumers instead of contributors, their persona is really nice. Think about it. Nice people. They wouldn't hurt anybody. They don't break any rules. They don't make any enemies. But if you're honest, they stay isolated. I'm in this circle, and you're in that circle. Are you with me? Well, let me illustrate how that plays out in real life. Anybody ever been to a picnic, uh, a park, and had a picnic? Yes, yes. Okay, l let's use it as an example. When you go to the park to have your picnic, there you bring your basket, maybe, and your linen and your utensils, 
because you're going to have this nice party, this nice picnic, and you're going to put your stuff on a bench in that park, and, and then you're going to eat, and then you're going to eat. You're a good guy, okay? So you're going to even pick up the trash and take it all up, and then you're going to put everything back in that basket, and when you leave that park, it's just as you found it. You're a nice person. Nice person. But somebody had to put that picnic table there. Somebody had to plant that tree to provide you shade to enjoy the day. Somebody had to put that trash can there. Somebody gave so that others could enjoy. Are you with me? And so that everything we have, it comes from God. And it's people that he's created and is called to make a difference in other people's lives. Because you know what? Trash cans get bent. And trash cans need to be replaced. Restrooms get old and they need to be repaired. And the lesson that we're learning is that somehow I want to be a contributor and not just a consumer. I want to find some way that I can make a difference and so that if I die and go to the grave, this world is different because I was born. That I leave this place better than when I found it. I don't have all the gifts you've got, but by by God's grace, I'm going to use what he's given me for his glory and to serve others. And what would happen in the kingdom of God that nice people would suddenly be transformed that says my contribution may not be as big or as significant seemingly as yours, but that's not true. It's all big. It's all significant. It's all important. And God is wanting us to understand that we have to love our neighbor as ourself. Praise God. Let's pray right now. I want you to just pray. It may be a reflective prayer. It may be a silent prayer. I don't know what it'll be, but I know that right now, We've got to say, and I've certainly, I'm making applications here in this local church, but I hope you're helping me to understand, hoping me, hearing me to say that, that, that it's not just what happens at Abundant Life Church. There is giving that goes on outside this church monetarily. It doesn't just come through these, uh, uh, these offering baskets. There's time, there's talent that's being given. It doesn't just come through here. And I say, praise God for that. I say that we've got to impact our world, but I'm telling you, it happens every place. Who are are you discipling right now? Who are you investing in? Who are you building a relationship with? If we've been called to go into the world and make disciples, I ask you to give yourself at least one name that you're saying, I'm investing in them and I am discipling them and I'm helping them. What is that name? What is that name of a ministry or a practice or a contribution to our community? What is that function? I'm telling you right now, if you can't answer that clearly, let you be clear today that Jesus says, I know that you love me, but it includes loving your neighbor. Hallelujah. I know I'm challenging you, but I do it without apology because I'm preaching his word. And secondly, I'm giving you a way to go back to that table and start a conversation in terms of this local church. But you don't need a program. You don't need anything to be a neighbor up and down your street at your workplace. If you'll start praying for divine appointments, and the first time we want to resist that, remember what Jesus said, the first and greatest commandment is to love me with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. But the second is equal in importance, and that is to love your neighbor as yourself. Hallelujah. As you're praying right now, as you're pondering, as the Holy Spirit's talking to you, in the name of Jesus, Somebody's got to clean this church. You're wrong if you're 
think I'm saying everybody's got to do any of these examples that I've given. I'm just saying we've all got to do our part. Each of us have a gift that the Lord has given us. And he said, we've got to be good managers or stewards of that gift in our time and talent and treasure. If you're a guest with us here today, I understand the nuance of this appeal. I understand the uniqueness of this, but I want you to know that God has a design and purpose for your life. And I hope you're getting out of this, that this church and this Bible that we preach never expects you to have to sit by the stand, sidelines and in the bleachers and just watch. I believe there's something in your heart that says, I want to make a difference. I want to do something. I want to fulfill the royal law to love my neighbor as myself. I'm telling you right now, what I'm preaching is the answer to our world. Government isn't the answer. Philanthropy isn't the answer. Just being kind and giving, etc. The answer is this Bible teaching that we must love God with all of our heart. And if we will, we will love our neighbor as ourselves. In the name of Jesus. Are you thinking? Are you praying? Are you yielding yourself to him right now? Lord, I want to be a good manager of what you've blessed me with.